So from John 10, Jesus is speaking. Very truly I tell you, anyone who does not enter the sheepfold by the gate, but climbs in by another way, is a thief and a bandit. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes ahead of them, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. They will not follow a stranger, but they will run from him because they do not know the voice of strangers. Jesus used this figure of speech with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So again, Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and bandits, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters by me will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief only comes to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. Meet us where we are this day, O oh God, and open our hearts to you. Amen. Suppose I gave you this card with instructions to complete this sentence. What I want out of life is... What I want out of life, complete the sentence. You know who really understands this? Uh, advertisers. You and I are exposed to hundreds of advertising messages every day with focus groups and uh, researchers, advertisers try to understand our human nature and our motivations. Their research is much more about us, uh, the consumers, than about their products. So commercials are built on one simple idea. If you buy A, you will get B. But B is rarely the product itself. Rather, B is an attempt to produce a positive emotion in us, to see ourselves in a perfect relationship, imagine ourselves on a higher social strata, or having this amazing experience. Uh, think Oscar-winning actor Matthew McConaughey sitting behind the wheel of a Lincoln in a strangely contemplative uh, car commercial. The ads don't say much about the features of a Lincoln, right? But they definitely give us the impression that uh, you should buy one if you're looking for a car that makes you think deep thoughts about life as you're driving to the grocery store. <laughs> what I want in life is advertisers seek to complete that sentence for us. In steps Jesus, who knows us better than we know ourselves. In the Gospel of John, he spins a metaphor where we are the sheep, he is the shepherd. A metaphor certainly that first century people uh, understood, and they were people not unlike us, who were trying to find the right gate uh, for living life. So Jesus says that, if a person climbs over the fence of a, of a sheep pen instead of going through the gate, 
then that person is a thief, a sheep thief. But in contrast, a shepherd walks right up to the gate, the gatekeeper opens it, and the sheep then recognize the shepherd's voice. He calls his own sheep by name, and he leads them out to green pastures. Then Jesus says, I am the gate for the sheep. Anyone who enters by me will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Perhaps nowhere else does Jesus express the intent of his ministry, his mission, more clearly than in this verse, I have come that they may have life and have it abundantly. Well, that's what we all want, right? A life that is abundant, a life that is, uh, that is real, has clarity, has purpose, and uh, uh, full of joy. I mean, who doesn't want that? And Jesus makes this contrast between his purpose and those who would climb over the fence who would rob us of, of an abundant life. So I'm wondering, what are the things that Jesus is pointing us to? Those things that would rob us of life. There are a number of voices out in our culture promising to make our life better. Advertisers, of course, but there are other cultural voices as well. And because we want, we want our life to be better, we listen and we sometimes follow often um, to our emotional and spiritual peril. Nine times out of ten, those voices... Uh, call us to complete our sentence with the externals. You know what I mean. Um, if I could just change jobs or have this one certain job, then my life would be better. If I could just live in this neighborhood, then my life and the life of my family would be better better. If I could just trim this body down, if I could just find a way to make more money, if I could change the attitude or the, uh, the behavior of my spouse or my partner to be more loving or gracious or responsive or spiritual, then if I could just find the right relationship, the right gal, the right guy, if I could change the externals, then life, my life would be better. These voices promise to make our life better, right? Certainly by the world standards, uh, you and I live in a prosperous time and country. Especially if we uh, think about our day compared with that of a generation ago or two generations ago. Uh, some of you know that, I, that our family has a, a new grandson born uh, a month ago. And we thought all was well with baby James on that first day, but the second day was chaos and trauma. He was not breathing well. One doctor thought it might be a heart problem. He was transferred to Brenner's Children's Hospital at Wake Forest, and he spent 14 days in the NICU with prayers and faith, an incredible team of, of doctors and nurses, and a 21st century neonatal uh, unit. James was sustained until his lungs... Uh, were developed, and he could breathe on his own. I mean, he's fine now. He's doing well. He's home to loving arms and a 
couple of rambunctious uh, brothers. But my guess is, 50 years ago, our family would have faced a heartbreaking, a heartbreaking scenario. Which is to say that we often take for granted that we live in a prosperous time. So we have to be careful when it comes to understanding abundance. We'll grow up thinking that abundance is about having more things and more stuff and more money. And we live in a place where success is often defined as having an abundant lifestyle. And if you listen to American preachers of the prosperity gospel, Jesus and faith are proclaimed as the way one becomes blessed with material success, which amazes me and sometimes disgusts me because I've read the Gospels and that Jesus is not in there. No, the abundant life that Jesus speaks of is best understood as a life that flourishes. Uh, Peter Gomes, the late Peter Gomes, who was the dean of the chapel at Harvard, uh, said it this way. For Jesus, abundance is fullness. That is the absence of anxiety and fear. The abundant life of which the Lord speaks has more to do with security than with prosperity. But one of our very human tendencies is to equate security with, with the abundance of money and things and stuff. Uh, it's, the, it's the externals. Have you seen the traveler's insurance commercial uh, where the dog is trying to hide his bone? And uh, he hides it first in the laundry basket and then is in, in his owner's chair. Then he digs a hole in the yard and hides the bone there. But he's still anxious, so we see him riding the bus. And he's going to the bank, and he gets a bank deposit box, you know, puts his bone in there. And then we see him trying to sleep, and he's tossing and turning. He can't. So the dog goes and retrieves his bone and brings it home. Again, I mean, advertisers understand our human condition, right? Our anxiety surrounding uh, losing our bones, losing our money, losing our stuff. There's not any security in that, is there? Any peace? No. I came that you may have life and have it in its abundance. That's what God wants for you and me. Another way to think about it is that God wants us to flourish. An old European tale uh, speaks of a rich nobleman who was riding uh, his horse throughout his vast countryside. And one day he came up with an old farmer named Hans. And Hans was bowing and saying a prayer for his meal. And when he looked up, he saw the nobleman and he said, Excuse me, sir, I, I didn't see you. I was just praying, uh, being thankful for my meal. And the rich nobleman looking down at the meager meal of uh, bread and cheese said, Well, if that's all I had to eat, I wouldn't feel much like giving thanks. Hans uh, said, Oh, it's quite sufficient. But it is remarkable that you should come by today because I had this strange dream last night. Uh, there, was, uh, there was beauty and peace all around us, and yet I could hear a voice saying, the richest man in the valley will die tonight. Your dreams are nonsense, said the nobleman, and he got on his horse and he took off. Still, what he heard uh, from Hans, the farmer, bothered him. So that evening, the nobleman called uh, his doctor, and he told him what he'd heard from, the, from Hans. The doctor said, it sounds like nonsense to me, but to give you peace of mind, I'll check you over, which he did. 
And he said, you are as healthy as that horse of yours. There's no way that you're going to die tonight. So the doctor left and the nobleman felt foolish for all the uh, effect that the old man's dream had had upon him. But then the next morning, a messenger arrived at the nobleman's estate. It's Hans the farmer, the messenger said. He died in his sleep last night. Ah, the richest man in the valley died in his sleep, grateful, an abundant life of trust and gratitude. Sometimes we ask the question, is our faith working for us? It's the wrong question. The right question is this. Is our faith worth working for? Is it worth working for? You and I know that anything worth having is worth working for. Uh, we work hard for an education. We work to raise our children in the right way. We work... Uh, at a good relationship and we work at having a good marriage. We work at being competent in our, in our work and in our careers. Uh, we, we work to be good at something, uh, playing a musical instrument, hitting a sand shot out of the bunker, uh, running a marathon, uh, mastering the art of teaching learning to, to paint an oceanscape on a canvas, to work on a project or, or a cause that means a lot to us. We know that anything worth having is worth working for. It's like the Manhattan tourist uh, who was on the way to a concert, but she was really, really lost, and she saw a man who looked like he maybe lived on the streets but she was desperate and she asked him do you know how to get to Carnegie Hall you've heard this hadn't you the man never looked up he said practice 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 <laughs> is our faith worth practice 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 is it worth working for. The church has many purposes, but one of our most important purposes is to be a place where you and I come and grow. Now, belonging, being a part of a, a community is important, but belonging is, is, is static. The beauty of the church is that it can be a place of movement, a place of spiritual movement, a, a place of, of growth. Or, or think about it this way. Who wants to be the same person a year from now or five years from now that we are right now, today? I mean, when, when life loses its pizzazz, generally it's because we are stuck in the same old, same old. Now, what we want, what, what we need is, is movement, growth, uh, a path of expanding ideas and perspective, spiritual maturity. The church, at its very best, offers us this path, which leads us to abundant living. A woman in her 30s. Uh, wrote this. She said, in December, I had a panic attack. I was out for supper with my husband and some good friends. I thought it was a reaction to the food. My heart raced. I was white as a sheet. I couldn't breathe. Six months earlier, my brother died at the age of 31. 
I thought I was doing okay until, uh, until that moment. After that, I began to realize the state of anxiety I was in and that it was not going away. Continued panic attacks and increasing fears began to shrink my world. I finally began to be honest with myself and with God. God was, to my surprise, willing to answer my questions and began to show me that life is not full of fear. God began to show me joy. I began to trust Him and to let go of some of my control. I joined a small group at church. What a surprise as I learned about myself and my anxiety. She writes, I've continued my spiritual journey. God has become my greatest friend in whom I trust so much more. At the beginning, I would pray, Lord, heal me from my anxiety. Now I pray, Lord, what is it exactly that I need healing from? In the process, she says, God has given me something special. Now that is growth. The abundant life that Jesus offers is linked to our spiritual growth. And here's what I know for sure. I have never seen anyone grow who didn't want to. One of my favorite sayings, one of my favorite spiritual mantras, and you've heard me say it a lot, is when the teacher, when the student is ready, the teacher appears. When you and I are ready, Jesus opens the gate. 